Welcome to this video where we're going to be looking at the causes, signs, symptoms, diagnosis and treatment of rhabdomyolysis. If you've not already done so, be sure to check out our other video on rhabdomyolysis where we discuss the pathophysiology. To start with, let's look at the causes of rhabdomyolysis. Causes can be separated into traumatic and non-traumatic and it's important to be familiar with these to heighten your suspicion that rhabdomyolysis may be present. And that's because rhabdomyolysis can have such a varied presentation. Traumatic causes are those that may cause direct muscle injury or compromise circulation. And these include direct trauma, such as blunt or penetrating trauma, which directly injures the muscle cells. Crush injuries, which prevent the supply of oxygen and glucose to muscle cells. Compartment syndrome, which will also prevent the supply of nutrients to the muscle cells. Surgery, which will directly damage muscle cells. Immobilization, which can be thought of a bit like a crush injury, where the patient's own body weight is crushing the muscle tissue, which inhibits oxygen and nutrients entering the muscle, causing muscle death. And it's important to think about your elderly patients who may have fallen and spent a prolonged time on the floor. Extensive full thickness burns, which will directly damage myocytes, and high voltage electrocution. So, think about the risk of rhabdomyolysis to the patient who has suffered a traumatic injury, who has spent a prolonged time immobilised, such as on the floor, and is going for surgery due to the injuries they have sustained. Non-traumatic causes are those that cause an insufficient energy supply or an inadequate oxygenation of the cell. These include extreme exertion, where energy is rapidly used quicker than it can be supplied. Hypokalemia, as potassium plays an important role in blood supply to muscle cells. Statins, which are direct myotoxins. The effect of statins is worsened when combined with a macrolide, such as erythromycin, as they decrease the clearance of statins. Seizures, which will cause prolonged muscular activity, depleting energy levels more rapidly than they can be supplied. Other causes include hyperkinetic disorders, delirium tremens, acute behavioural disturbances, heat stroke, malignant hyperthermia, infection, endocrinopathies such as hyperthyroidism, antihistamines, antipsychotics and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and sympathomimetic drugs such as amphetamine and cocaine. Now we have discussed the causes of rhabdomyolysis, let's look at how these patients may present. Rhabdomyolysis ranges from an asymptomatic illness to a life-threatening condition. This means that symptoms are going to vary between patients, which is why the history is so important. Clinically, rhabdomyolysis is exhibited by a triad of symptoms, which include muscle pain, muscle weakness, and dark urine, described as tea-coloured urine. However, this triad of symptoms is seen in under 10% of patients suffering with rhabdomyolysis. However, one or two symptoms may live in isolation. Other symptoms that may be present include a fever due to the inflammatory cascade that is initiated by the rapid breakdown of muscle cells. Tachycardia, which may be a result of electrolyte abnormalities or reduced circulating volume. 
hypotension as fluid moves from the intravascular compartment and into the damaged muscle cells. Reduced urine output, which is again due to low circulating volume, but may also be worsened if there is an acute kidney injury. Renal angle tenderness, which is at the costovertebral angle. Patients may also have abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting. The most serious complication of rhabdomyolysis in the days following initial presentation is an acute kidney injury which develops in 33% of patients who have rhabdomyolysis. Common electrolyte abnormalities include hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia which is soon followed by hypercalcemia. So now let's look at some of the investigations and possible findings that may be present in patients who we suspect to have rhabdomyolysis. Creatine kinase levels may be raised and greater than 5,000 units is generally considered to indicate serious muscle damage, which is five times greater than the upper normal cutoff limit. Serum and urine myoglobin may be present. Urinary dipstick may be positive for blood. Urea and creatinine levels may be raised. Potassium may be raised. Calcium levels may be low. Phosphate and uric acid levels may be raised. A blood gas may show a lactic acidosis. And an ECG may present with changes that are consistent with hyperkalemia, such as flattening of the P wave, prolongation of the QRS complex, peak T waves, and bradycardia. Diagnosis is made based on laboratory results, but the patient history and presenting symptoms should cause a high index of suspicion. Remember that rhabdomyolysis may not present immediately as laboratory findings can take time to manifest. Creatine kinase levels are the most sensitive and clinically useful laboratory test for evaluating the presence of rhabdomyolysis and typically rises within the first 12 hours of onset and will remain elevated for several days. Normal creatine kinase levels will vary depending on patients, but serum creatine kinase levels that are five times the upper limit of normal are used to identify rhabdomyolysis. Once creatine kinase levels exceed 5,000 international units per litre, then there's a high possibility that the patient's going to go into an acute kidney injury. This should start to decline after two to four days of treatment, and if it doesn't, then this would suggest that there is ongoing muscle breakdown, such as in compartment syndrome. Urinalysis may show myoglobin urea. However, myoglobin has a half-life of two to three hours, so this may or may not be present, and myoglobin concentrations tend to normalise within 6 to 8 hours following muscle injury. There may also be proteinuria and hematuria if there is an acute kidney injury presenting with either a nephritic or nephrotic syndrome. Patients may also have reduced urine output. So now let's look at how we're going to treat and manage these patients. An important aspect in the treatment of rhabdomyolysis is the prevention and treatment of the underlying cause. Remember that this is not a disease process that lives in isolation and is the manifestation of another pathological process. Using your knowledge of the pathophysiology and causes can help to eliminate or reduce the risk of rhabdomyolysis and this is going to be of most benefit to the patient. 
When rhabdomyolysis is suspected, regardless of the underlying etiology, one of the most important treatment goals is to avoid acute kidney injury. Because of the possible accumulation of fluids in the muscular compartments and the associated hypovolemia, fluid management is imperative. This will also aid in the removal of waste products from the blood and the removal of myoglobin from the kidney to prevent it from causing any harm. Patients may also require electrolytes to correct any abnormalities and in extreme cases may even require hemodialysis. To recap, rhabdomyolysis is a clinical syndrome where there is a sudden and excessive breakdown of muscle that causes the release of the intracellular components into general circulation. Causes can be separated into traumatic and non-traumatic. Traumatic causes are those that cause direct myocyte injury or compromised circulation. And non-traumatic causes are those that cause an insufficient energy supply or inadequate oxygenation of the cell. Rhabdomyolysis ranges from an asymptomatic illness to a life-threatening condition and may be exhibited by a triad of symptoms which include muscle pain, muscle weakness and dark urine. The most serious complication of rhabdomyolysis is that of an acute kidney injury. Diagnosis is made based on laboratory results and creatine kinase levels are the most sensitive and clinically useful laboratory test. An important aspect of the treatment is the prevention and treatment of the underlying cause and an important goal is to avoid acute kidney injury. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other videos and if there are any topics you would like us to cover then please leave a comment in the comment section below.